So when my wife and I got married, my wife Chrissy and I got married uh, 21 years ago, we were super poor, and, but we didn't, when it came to Christmas, we didn't want to do a real Christmas tree, we just not into getting all sap all over ourselves. And so we uh, got a hand-me-down fake tree, and for years and years and years, put that stupid fake tree up, and, but it wasn't pre-lit because it was a hand-me-down, couldn't afford that, so we'd wrap the lights around it every single year, take them off every year, they would never work the next year, have to get new lights, just a pain in the butt. About, about 10 years ago is when I hit it big, real big, and I could afford a pre-lit tree. And, uh, <laughs> but I had to wait till after Christmas uh, to buy them on sale. And so Home Depot was doing their after Christmas sale to get rid of their, you know, the, get all their Christmas stuff. And I went to Home Depot and I bought a pre-lit Christmas tree for the next year. I was so excited and it went and put it right into the storage closet and it sat there all year long. And then the next year I couldn't wait to get it out and set up my pre-lit Christmas tree. And I set it up and I plug it in, and half the lights didn't work. And so I'm like, oh, no, no, no. And so I'm like checking every light, all the fuses and the little plug-ins. See, I could not figure it out for about an hour. And so I did what a mature adult man would do, and I kicked that tree over, (laughs) and I picked it up. I'm not exaggerating. I propped the front door open, and I threw it out the front door almost all the way to the street. And my whole family was truly singing joyful, joyful. I, I mean, I had the three girls that lived with me crying that day. It was a really good way to enter into the uh, Christmas season. But I learned two lessons that day. Lesson number one, that uh, Christmas lights are the spawn of Satan. Uh, like, they are the worst thing in the world. I think they were m- created to annoy you and drive you crazy. The second thing I learned that day is that sooner or later you're you're going to do something that you're going to have to ask forgiveness for, or someone's going to do something against you that you're going to have to, you know, choose to forgive them or not. It's just, we can't avoid it. it. Sooner or later, we're going to have to ask for forgiveness, or someone's going to have to ask for our forgiveness. And that day, it was obvious who needed to ask for forgiveness. Home Depot, because they sold me that stupid tree. I was totally innocent on that day. But, hey, I'm going to come back to this whole concept of forgiveness a second. But first, I want to catch you up if you've missed the last few weeks of where we've been in this series. Today we're in part four of a five-week series all on prayer. And what I know about all of us, I know about you, regardless of where in your spiritual journey, because I know about me as well, is that we start praying because of wants and needs. You know, and sometimes we get what we ask for, but other times we get nothing. And the other thing I know about all of us is we stop praying because we didn't get what we asked for. You know, you go, hey, I prayed, I asked, but, you know, God never answered, nothing ever happened. And perhaps it was a series of nothings that convinced you that there's nothing to prayer, that convinced you that prayer doesn't work. Well, the question kind of we've been, you know, asking throughout this series is, what if the reasons our prayers don't seem to work is because we aren't praying correctly? Like, what if the reason prayer is so hit and miss and we don't hear anything and so many of our prayers go unanswered and nothing ends up happening is because we've gotten prayer all wrong? What if there's something missing in how we pray? Well, according to Jesus, there is. See, as as God-fearing Jews, Jesus' first century followers, they grew up praying. But they'd become frustrated with prayer because, just like us, because nothing was happening. And then they saw Jesus pray. And they realized, man, there was something different about his prayers. I mean, his prayers, they, they were powerful. His, his prayers, they were answered. His, his prayers, they were effective. And it made them even more discontent with their own prayers. And as they watched Jesus praying, they knew that something was missing about what prayer was, about how prayer works. So they finally said, hey, Jesus, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus did. And throughout this series, we're looking at a passage in Matthew 6 where Jesus taught his first century followers how to pray. Now, this series is so important for everyone. I mean, regardless of where you're at, regardless if you would say, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus or not, or I'm kind of new to this church thing, or I've been a part of church my whole life, or, you know, I believe everything written in the Bible, or I don't even know that anything written in the Bible is real. Regardless of who you are, this series is so important because when you need something bad enough, when you feel low enough, When you need someone bigger than yourself, when you feel lost and hopeless, when circumstances are outside of your control, when you're at your end, at some point, you probably have prayed or you will pray. Therefore, we must learn how to pray so we don't go our whole lives participating in it without experiencing the power of it. 
See, according to Jesus, prayer is powerful. It's powerful in your life. It's powerful in the lives of other people. It's powerful in how you view and relate to God. And since you're going to pray at some point anyway, you might as well learn how to pray so you can experience the power of it. Now, as we've discovered over the last few weeks, Jesus, he was very specific. But instead of starting with how to pray, he actually started with how not to pray. And this here's how he starts his lesson on prayer. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, Saying, we talked about this, don't pray to try to impress others because that doesn't impress God. Instead, Jesus said, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And Jesus' point was, hey, getting consistently by yourself to pray is important because, I get it, you can't see your heavenly Father, but he sees you. And when you do this, he will reward you. And then as we talked about, Jesus continues how to instruct how not to pray. He goes, hey, don't go, don't go on and on about what you, what you want because, he says, your heavenly Father knows what you need before you ask him. Which, of course, raises the question, so why pray? See, so many of us have reduced prayer to informing God about our needs or our wants or our wishes. But if God already knows then why pray? And Jesus would say, now you're asking the right question. See, could it be that the purpose of prayer is not ultimately about trying to get stuff from God? And Jesus would say, if that thought's going through your mind, you're on to something. You're on the verge of a breakthrough. You're now ready to learn how to pray. And he says, this then is how you should pray. You ask for it, here it is. Here's how to pray to your heavenly Father who is unseen when you're alone and no one can see you. Here's how to pray in a way that works. And then Jesus goes on uh, to teach this prayer and, and uh, we've, this is what we've been breaking down over the last few weeks. And so let's go ahead and read this all out loud together. Here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now, as many of us know, this is known as the Lord's Prayer, and many of us have memorized it and thoughtlessly recited it numerous times, all the while missing Jesus' entire point. Because Jesus wasn't teaching his followers exact words to pray every time you pray verbatim. He was teaching them why to pray and the elements of how to pray in a way that works. And he starts by, he goes, he says, hey, start by recognizing who you're talking to and declare his greatness, our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your name. As we discovered a couple weeks ago, if you rush by this, you'll resist what follows. <clears throat> and what follows is why we pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Essentially, Jesus is saying that the purpose of prayer is to surrender our will, not to impose it. The purpose of prayer is not to impose our will on God, but to surrender ourselves to the will of God. We should pray there. We should stay there until we can say with all sincerity, your will, not mine. Your will, not mine. When it comes to praying in a way that works, I mean, this, this is a game changer. Now from there, Jesus instructs us to pray for three things with a posture of surrender. He instructs us to pray for provision, pardon, and protection. Last week, we looked at provision. Give us today our daily bread. Next week, we're going to look at protection. Today, we're going to talk about pardon. Now, I said a second ago, many of us, you know, <coughs> what stopped many of us from praying is not getting what we prayed for, not getting what we asked for. But from my experience, there are a couple other things that cause, many, that cause some of us to stop praying as well. One of those things is guilt. Oh, I sinned again. I messed up again. I screwed up again. I said I never would do it again. I mean, I did it before. I asked God to forgive me, and I was sincere about it. And then I did it again, and I did it again. And if I'm being honest with myself, I'm probably going to do it again. I mean, I feel way too guilty to go before God. And the heaviness and the bondage of guilt and shame has caused some of us to stop praying altogether. Another thing that has caused many, many of us to maybe just stop praying is hurt. Hurt that other people have caused us. Hurt, pain, rejection, abuse, hatred, gossip, 
from a supposed friend, a family member, someone who we trusted, easily leads us to become bitter and resentful and angry toward them. And if left unresolved, we eventually become bitter and resentful and angry to God. God, how could you allow this to happen to me? God, why would you allow this to happen to me? And the longer those questions go unanswered, the more bitter we become toward God and the less likely we are to pray. Guilt and shame, anger from our hurt, causes many people to stop praying. Maybe you. And as we're going to discover, those things should not stop us from praying. According to Jesus, they should drive us to our Heavenly Father and should inform us on how to pray. This then is how you should pray, Jesus said. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And then he says, and here's our focus of today, and forgive us our debts. When you pray, Jesus says, ask your heavenly father, to, heavenly father to forgive you for your debts. Other translations say for your sins or your trespasses against him. To understand why we need to pray this and why we should pray this, we really need to understand what sin is. According to the writers of scripture, sin is a violation. It's a violation against holy creator God. It's a violation against his created intent for us, which is to be holy how he is holy. And it's a violation against his created will for us, which is to glorify him. See, when we sin, we don't glorify God. And it could be that we're not glorifying him with our bodies or with how we relate to others or with our choices. But the bottom line is when we sin, we don't glorify God. When we sin, we hurt ourselves. We hurt others. We hurt our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And it's so interesting that Jesus calls sin a debt. I think he calls sin a debt here because when we sin, we take something from God. When we sin, we take the glory, God, the glory from God that he deserves. When we sin, we make something other than him our Lord. When we sin, we truly owe holy creator God something, something we can never pay back, something only he can forgive if he chooses to forgive. And so Jesus says, when you pray, ask your Father in heaven to forgive you for your sin against him, forgive you for the debt that you owe him. Now, this can be, and this should be applied to, you know, praying for salvation. Like, what, you, you've got to know, sin, sin broke our relationship with God, with holy God, with creator God. Sin broke our relationship with him, the relationship that our heavenly father created us for, both in this life and in the next but because of God's great love for us, he sent Jesus. He sent his one and only son. And through Jesus' life, death, and resurrection, Jesus offered salvation. He offered forgiveness for our sin and a restored relationship with our heavenly father in this life and in the next. And all we have to do to receive that forgiveness, to receive that salvation, to have that restored relationship with our heavenly father is put our faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of our sins and the leader of of our life. And man, if you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that a little later today. But even though Jesus' words can be applied to praying for salvation here, Jesus' instruction here is really for those who have already put their faith in Jesus. See, after we put our faith in Jesus, we still sin. I don't know where ever, anyone ever got the the idea in their mind that putting your faith in Jesus makes you perfect. Putting your faith in Jesus doesn't make you perfect. It just makes you forgiven. It doesn't make you perfect. It makes you forgiven. We still sin after we put our faith in Jesus. Jesus is saying, when you pray, ask your Father in heaven to forgive you, which doesn't seem to make sense for those of us who are followers of Christ because the writers of Scripture tell us that the moment we put our faith in Jesus, all of our past, all of our present, and all of our future sins are forgiven. So why do we, as followers of Christ, need to ask for forgiveness when we sin? I think it's for a couple reasons. Because number one, sin hurts our relationship with God. After we put our faith in Jesus, sin no longer breaks our relationship with God. As followers of Christ, we are now adopted sons and daughters and children of God. We can't sin our way out of a relationship with him. Just like your kids can't sin their way out of a relationship with you, parents. 
But it does hurt it. It does hurt our relationship with God. It prevents us from growing in a relationship with him. Not because God's removing himself from us, but because when we choose to sin, we're choosing to walk away from him. We're choosing not to follow Jesus as the leader of our lives. So sin hurts our relationship with God. But the other thing is sin ultimately hurts us. I mean, sin, you know this. However you define sin, you, you know this. Sin destroys relationships. It kills marriages. It generates guilt and shame and regret. It leads to addiction. Sin prevents us from being transformed into everything that our heavenly father created us to be and therefore experiencing the life and the hope and the peace and the joy and the fulfillment that is produced only through a growing relationship with him. It's why I say all the time, sin doesn't make us bad. Sin makes us dead. See, sin, it's like a chain. The choice to sin, it's like a choice to wrap ourselves in a chain. When we sin and we don't ask forgiveness, the chain, it gets tighter and tighter and tighter. And the tighter this chain gets, the more surrendered we become to this chain. We become in bondage to it. It essentially controls us. Essentially, the sin that we're chained to becomes our Lord. The sin we're chained to becomes our leader instead of Jesus. And that's why Jesus said, you need to pray and ask your heavenly father to forgive you. Now, what, what asking our heavenly father forgive us is not, hey, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but I'm probably going to do this again tomorrow. Like parents, you know this. If your kid is late for curfew and they come home and go, sorry, tomorrow I'm going to do it again, you'll be like, you're not sorry. And no, I don't forgive you. You're grounded. What asking God's forgiveness for is taking that chain and saying, I am going to release it. I am going to let it go. I am going to throw off that sin. It's essentially the word repentance. Repentance means I was walking towards something. I was, something was the Lord of my life. Something was leading me. And I, I am going to turn the other way and follow someone new or something new. That's essentially when we put our faith in Jesus, what we do. Say, I'm going to turn toward you, Jesus. When we sin after putting our faith in Jesus, saying, ah, dang it. I'm walking away from that. Jesus, I'm taking a step back toward following you. Listen, this is how we restore and maintain a growing relationship with Jesus. This is how we break free from guilt. It's how we break free from shame. This is how we follow Jesus as our Lord, as our leader. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. And forgive us our debts. And that's where many people stop. However, there's a second part to this. As we also, which means in the same way we have forgiven our debtors. See, this is a request with a catch. And the catch is, Father, forgive me in the same way and to the same degree that I have forgiven the people who have sinned against me. Who have wronged me. Who have hurt me. Who have trespassed against me. Jesus is saying, pray for forgiveness for sinning against your heavenly father, but don't ask for something you're unwilling to extend to others. Je it's interesting. Jesus calls those who sin against us our debtors. And why would he call them our debtors? Because when someone sins against us, when someone hurts you or wrongs you or violates you, it's as if they take something from you. They take your trust, your freedom, your security, your innocence, your peace, your dignity, your self-worth, maybe an opportunity, something that they can never pay back no matter how hard they tried, something that only you and I can choose to forgive. Do you know what forgiveness is, forgiving others is? It's not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision. 
It's a decision that the debt they owe you is canceled. Forgiveness says, I'm going to make the decision that you don't owe me anymore. I'm canceling your debt. Jesus says, when you pray to ask for forgiveness from your heavenly father, before you move on, ask if you're withholding from someone the very thing you expect your heavenly father to give you. Now, for some of you, you're not sure you want to pray anymore. Because you don't think you can and you don't think you should forgive that person for what they took from you. And listen, I have no intention of downplaying the pain you've experienced or minimizing the pain you've experienced and I can't touch on every single application of this. But what I know for sure is that regardless of how we've been sinned against, it's vitally important that we choose to forgive. And the Apostle Paul tells us why. In Ephesians 4, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And you know this, when someone sins against us, what do we naturally feel? Bitterness, rage, anger, revenge, the desire to do evil against them. And Paul is saying, you got to get rid of all that. Well, why, Paul? Why should I get rid of all that? And you already know the answer. Because those things will only continue to hurt you. And weigh you down. And entangle you. You go, well, Paul, you don't know my story. Paul, you don't know how wronged I've been. If you did, you'd understand how I feel. I just can't stop that. I just can't get rid of that. But Paul seriously thinks that we can get rid of this and be freed from all of that. And it's worth paying attention to what he says next because if we don't get rid of it, the damage that is gonna, it's gonna cause you going into the future could be irreversible. I have never once, and you have never once in your entire life met a healthy person who's harboring bitterness, who's harboring anger, who's harboring rage. You have never met a healthy person who has those things in their life. And you're like, okay, Paul, you got me. How do I get rid of it? And Paul goes, thank you for asking. Here's how. Be kind and compassionate to one another. And here it is, forgiving each other. Paul's saying you don't get rid of bitterness and anger and hurt and rage and resentment by blaming them, by moving, by gossiping, by ignoring, by taking revenge. You do so by forgiving. You stole my trust. You stole my innocence. You stole my heart. You stole my freedom, my security, my peace, my dignity. Here's some forgiveness. And I know it seems irrational, but it's so important because unforgiveness to other people is also. Like a chain. And when we don't forgive, we get wrapped up in that chain. And in doing so, we enslave ourselves to bitterness. We enslave ourselves to rage. We enslave ourselves to hurt. We enslave ourselves to anger. And the longer we live in that unforgiveness, the tighter that chain gets. And before we know it, that bitterness becomes our Lord. That pain becomes our Lord. That anger and that rage becomes our Lord because we become surrendered to that bitterness. So we become in bondage to that rage. We become controlled by that anger. In trying to justify why not to forgive others, essentially, we sentence ourselves to chains. We end up carrying the past into the present and into the future. And the only way Paul's saying to be free of all of that You've got to forgive. And if that's not motivation enough for you, Paul gives the ultimate reason behind us as followers of Christ choosing to give. He says, forgiving others, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
Jesus, one new covenant command, one new covenant command to his followers, to those of us who have put our faith in him, is to love others just as he first loved us. And that is what Paul is alluding to here. Listen, we don't forgive others because they deserve to be forgiven. We don't forgive others because they're forgivable or even because they want to be forgiven. We forgive because we are forgiven. We say, you don't owe me anymore because on the cross, Jesus said, you don't owe him anymore. We cancel their debt because on the cross, Jesus looked at us and said, debt canceled. When we really understand what Jesus did for you, when you and I really understand what Jesus did for us, forgiving others becomes necessary. Our decision to forgive has more to do with what Jesus did for us than what they did to us. Our decision to forgive has more to do with they, what Jesus did for us than what they did to us. The degree to which you understand the significance of, of your and my forgiveness is the degree to which you are free to forgive, forgive and the degree to which you must forgive. Our decision to forgive is how we follow, is one of the key ways that we follow Jesus as the leader of our life. Did that thing just blow up? <laughs> Put your sunglasses on. Woo! I, I'm a halo is going to come overhead and wings. It's going to get real up here. Listen, our decision to forgive is one of the key ways we follow Jesus. Refusing to forgive others while asking to be forgiven, it makes us one of those folks that Jesus talked about at the beginning of his prayer lesson. It makes us a hypocrite, a pretender. And Jesus would say, don't be a hypocrite. Hey, you expect to be forgiven, right? You expect to be forgiven by your heavenly father, right? Then forgive. The, the real question is how? How do we forgive others who have sinned against us? And Jesus would go, that's why you pray. Sometimes you can forgive others without prayer, right? It's a little hurt, it's a little violation. You just need to forgive them and move on. Other times we can't because their sin against us, their debt against us is so huge and so painful. Jesus says, this is why you pray. When you pray, ask your heavenly father to forgive you for your sin against him and then pray this. God, Jesus, help me forgive them just as you first forgave me. This is a powerful prayer. Did you know that you and I are never able to forgive someone by focusing on them? You're never gonna be able to forgive someone by focusing on them. The only, way we're able, the only way that we are able to truly forgive someone is to let go of our well-rehearsed stories that justify our anger and our hurt and our bitterness and our resentments by putting our eyes on the forgiver. Praying like this, Jesus, help me forgive them just as you first forgave me. It works because we take our eyes and we take our focus off them, off the offense, and we put them back on Jesus, on the source of forgiveness, on the power of forgiveness. Keeping our eyes on Jesus and asking his help to forgive them is how this chain is loosened and is the only chance we have for that chain to be shed one day, hopefully, completely. Now this, this was a really big deal to Jesus. How big a deal? What well, did you know that, did you, do you know how Jesus concludes his lesson on prayer in Matthew 6? By the way, it's not the way that we ended at weddings. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the, you know how it ends. That's not, Jesus actually never said those words. It's great. Those are great words. They're awesome. It just was added by a scribe later. It, Jesus doesn't end his lesson eloquently as we like because he's not writing song lyrics. He's teaching us how to pray. To understand the important, to, to, under, to underscore how important it is to Jesus that we forgive, he ends his lessons, uh, lesson on prayer with the following statement. And this statement is going to create some tension for you. Jesus' statement is going to create some questions for you. And since Jesus didn't resolve that tension, and since Jesus didn't answer those questions, I won't either. I'll just let you sit with it. Here's how he ends. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. There's a lot of depth to that. But I think on 
the most basic level, Jesus is reminding us that our vertical relationship with him cannot be separated from horizontal relationships with other people. They are interconnected. And when we try to separate this from this, you know what we, we do? We reduce God to a cleaning product. To ask God to forgive us while we're refusing to forgive your, your brother or your ex-spouse or your manager or your neighbor or your parent or that person who hurt you reduces God to a conscience cleanser. I pray and I ask God to forgive me for my sin and he forgives me and I feel a lot better about myself but I'm not about ready to forgive you. As long as me and God are good, I'm good. Contrary to what you might have been told, God is not a conscience cleanser. There's another name for when we separate the vertical from the horizontal. You know what that name is? It's called religion. This is why so many religious people turn out to be hypocrites. Religion is often an attempt to use God. Religion reduces faith to magic and turns God into a conscience cleaner. And in the end, religion, it leaves you empty. It leaves you unchanged. It leaves you shallow. You'll confuse knowledge with true depth. Correct belief will become a substitute for following Jesus, and you'll run the risk of missing God. Jesus did not call us into religion. Jesus called us into a relationship. And Jesus says, in this relationship, this then is how you should pray. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And you say, if you get stuck there, go ahead and go back a couple sentences. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Not my will, but yours. How do you want me to pray for my sin against you? How do you want me to pray for their sin against me? Whatever it is, I surrender my will to you. I surrender my will to yours. See, praying the way Jesus taught us to pray, it's an invitation. It's, it's definitely not an invitation to comfort. Definitely not that. It's an invitation to follow him as your leader. It's an invitation to surrender to him as your Lord. It's an invitation to declare your dependence on him for your pardon, for your forgiveness, and your dependence on him to forgive and pardon them. And man, I hope you accept Jesus' invitation of surrender. I hope you and I choose to accept Jesus' invitation of surrender because surrendering to Jesus ensures we don't allow our chains of sin, of guilt, of addiction, of bitterness, of anger, of resentment, of revenge, of hurt to become our Lord. Do you know that these are not good masters? Do you know that these do not deserve your loyalty? They'll destroy your presence and they will enslave your future. So does prayer work? Well, the Jesus way of praying works. Praying for forgiveness works on you. Praying for God's forgiveness works ultimately on you and me. Praying to forgive others ultimately works on you. It works on us and in us to free us. So, what do you need to ask your heavenly father forgiveness for? Whatever it is, surrender it. I mean, release those things. Let go of those things. Throw those chains off so you can break free from that guilt, so you can break free from that shame and continue growing in a relationship with your heavenly father. It's through that relationship where you experience the life and hope and peace and joy and freedom that can only come from him. What do you need to ask your heavenly father forgiveness for? Secondly, this is harder. Who do you need to forgive? Listen, I know every... I know you have every reason not to forgive them. And if I heard your story, I'd probably be tempted to give you a pass. But Jesus wouldn't give you a pass. And he w wouldn't because he knows what a lack of forgiveness does to you. So because Jesus loves you, he invites you to forgive. If you do, you're gonna be introduced to a freedom from bitterness and anger and rage and resentment that you cannot experience any other way. You know, uh, I've said it numerous times, whenever someone ends up leaving relevant, it, it, uh, it, it tears me up for a lot of reasons. And you know, just on the human ego side, I take it super personal, but 
man, I view our church as a community, as a family, and it just, it tears me up when someone leaves. But unfortunately, we live in America, and it's just what happens in America, and people come and go, and it's sad to watch. Um, so I've had, I've had to get used to coping with it. Uh, but <laughs> one time, this one time, it did more than tore me up. It crushed me. Because one of my closest friends um, left relevant. And when they left, they also decided that they wanted to just tear me down and tear down my character and spread just slander about me. And um, I was hurt. Like talking about it, it still tears me up. I was hurt. I was angry. And I became so cynical. I became so bitter. And this started affecting every relationship. I mean, I didn't realize, but I was chaining myself. And I truly was, so I got to the place where I was not able to love anybody. I wasn't able to open my heart up to anyone. I was so angry and I was so bitter. And I know how Jesus taught us to pray. And I prayed this prayer repeatedly. Forgive me as I forgive our debtors. Forgive my debt as I forgive our debtors. Forgive my debt. And over time, like, I felt like, man, it was, the chains were loosening a little bit. And they were, they were loosening a little bit, but also every time then someone brought up their name, the, ah! by the way, if you say you forgive someone, but you say, don't talk about them, you have not, just so you know. <laughs> so I kept continuing to pray, but I also got some help. Uh, and by the way, whether it's breaking free from your own sin or to forgive other people, you may need some help. You may need some to share with someone in your tea life group or get some counseling or go through fresh start or go get some prayer from a prayer team. You may, may need some help. I knew I needed some help. So I went through our fresh start short-term group. I went through it longer though. It's like eight weeks. I went through it for a year. Uh, it took me a little longer to wrap my mind around it. Um, and through that process of fresh start and praying this prayer every day, forgive me as I forgive them. Forgive me as I forgive them. I, the chain started to be loosened and it, I was actually finally able to let the chains go and I was free to love again. <laughs> I was free. Then that relationship will never be the same again. Like I'll never be as close to that person as I once was. We actually have a relationship today, but it'll never be the same. But I'm free. I'm free. I'm free from bitterness. I'm free to love again. I'm free to open myself up to be hurt again. And I would never be if I did not choose to forgive. See, so praying for forgiveness, it works on you. Before we leave today, we're gonna to take a couple moments in, in prayer again. And I'm gonna put it on the screen here, but here's what I'm gonna give you just a couple moments to pray through. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sin. And Jesus, help me to forgive them just as you first forgave me. But before I give you a moment to do that, just wanna quickly say to those of you who have never put your faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of your sins and lead your life, he wants to forgive you. He wants to forgive you so you can be free from the bondage of sin in this life and in the next. He wants to forgive you. He wants to set you free. It's why he died and he died and it's why he rose and he is just waiting for you to accept the free gift that he came to give you. And you accept it by putting your faith in him. Asking him to be the forgiver of your sins, your savior. Asking him to be the leader of your life, your Lord. I'm not going to make this my Lord anymore. So as we spend some time uh, in this moment, if you're ready to put your faith in Jesus, I think you should maybe focus on that first one and ask Jesus to be the forgiver of your sin and leader of your life. Go ahead and spend the next few moments in prayer.
Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sin against you. And Jesus, help me to forgive them just as you first forgave me. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.